Greetings and welcome to episode 24 of the Transform Podcast. It's Tuesday, January 4th, 2022, and I'm your host, Christopher Anastasio, and welcome to the new year. Here we are in 2022. We had a bunch of episodes in uh, December 2021 where we used those opportunities to kind of look at end of year planning, look at you know how you might strategically plan your marketing and your communications for the coming year. And before you know it, uh, those 30 days are gone and we're, we're into, uh, into the countdown of, uh, of 2022 itself. So four days in now. So hope everybody had a great holiday. Everybody had a great new year um, and is ready to go, ready to roll for 22 um, and to go out there and grow your business, get more revenue, get more clients. And we here at Transform are here to help you do that if you wish to engage with us. If not, obviously, uh, we hope you enjoy the podcast uh, in the meantime and take all the value you can from it and apply it to your businesses. So today, guys, I want to talk about um, a little bit of of a different spin on features and benefits. I'll I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but, But something that occurred to me that I'm working through almost real time, so I'm kind of thinking out loud with you guys here on the podcast today, uh, that that kind of really hit me when I saw a particular advertisement on, I believe it was New Year's Eve. It might be off a day forward or back, but I'm pretty sure it was Friday the 31st. And, and, and it makes sense that, that this company ran this ad to kind of kick off 2022. Uh, would have been perfect timing for that. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk about that ad and what it did to me, what it made me think of when I saw it. And then, and then subsequently, what it's made me think about since then in regard to the traditional features and benefits kind of debate, you know, in terms of, not necessarily debate, but the whole, the whole use of features and benefits in advertising and how you use both of them effectively and when you use them and things like that. So this kind of puts a new spin on that. But, um, so I want to kind of walk through that. I want to talk to you guys about both of those things and then kind of leave the question open as to like, what do you do with with all this information? How, you know, for your business, where do you go from here with what I'm going to talk to you about today? So it's kind of three parts, I guess we're going to work through uh, on this episode. So, so let me just start with features and benefits. So if you guys aren't familiar with this, if you're new to marketing or you just haven't used this tactic in your marketing, it may be something to consider. But every product or service, you can, whatever you're going to say about that product or service you can essentially break down into one of two categories. You're either talking about features, things like endemic to the product or the service, like aspects of it, parts of it, elements of it, right? Or you're talking about the benefits, like if the end user or the, or the consumer buys that product or service, what do they get from having that product or service or getting that service, right? So, for example, the, the, the best example I've ever, I've ever um, I don't want to say ever come across, but, but probably the, the simplest one that, that quickly gets the point home, hits the point home, is let's say we were talking about a power drill, okay? So we're talking about tools, we're talking about power drills, and I pick up a particular power drill and I'm trying to sell it to you, Right? And I'm using features of a power drill, you know, to, to sell to you. I'd be saying things like, this power drill lasts, you know, 24 hours without being recharged. It has a lithium ion battery that has, you know, tremendous charging capacity, blah, 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 blah. Or this, this uh, lithium ion, or the, excuse me, this power drill, uh, you know, rotates at 1,000 RPM, uh, you know, uh, you know, more than twice as much as any other drill. So as you can see, I'm I'm talking about technical specifications of the drill. And since I know drills, you know, I'm impressed by these things, and I assume you will be too, right? Uh, You know, the, the, the plastic casing of the drill can be dropped from 500 feet, you know, in the air, and it won't break. It's, it's that durable, you know, things like that are features of that particular product, right? So then you'd say, okay, well, okay, yeah, that makes sense, Chris. I mean, I hear commercials that do that. I hear advertising that does that when it comes to power tools or whatever the product might be. What do you mean by benefits? Well, the benefit of the drill in a very, very simplified form is it makes a hole in the wall. 
and you're buying the hole in the wall, not the drill. You don't buy a drill so that you have a drill and you can stare at the drill and you can put the drill in and out of your toolbox. You buy a drill so that you can get a hole in the wall because you need to hang something. You need to put something there. So the drill, the benefit of the drill, and again, I mean, this is about as simplified as it gets, and obviously you can come up with better benefits than this, but in its most raw, stripped-down, simplified form, the benefit of the drill is the hole in the wall. And you notice when I say that, I'm not talking about the drill at all. I mean, I'm not even using the word drill. Okay, so a little bit better, a little bit more dressed-up benefit would be, you know, um, this drill... Uh, drills holes three times faster than any other drill, so you're back to spending time with your family in no time, or you're back to watching the football game in a jiffy, okay? <laughs> you know, things like that. So you take a feature, potentially, of the drill. It doesn't necessarily have to be one, but it, it can often be a specific feature, but you sort of translate it into a benefit, okay? Um, you know, let's take the battery example, you know, has a, you know, 500 watt, you know, lithium ion battery, I'm not even using the right terms here probably, but, you know, has, has a certain size lithium ion battery with, you know, 500 hours of capacity to it. So that you don't have to keep plugging it in and slowing down your job, right? So that you can take the drill wherever you need to and complete the job faster. You see what I'm saying? So again, not perfect, but it's an example of how you convert a feature, a technical feature in this case of a power tool into a benefit. So the longer charging capacity of the battery means that I can get work done faster because I don't have to keep plugging in the drill and taking up charge time when I should be working and drilling holes in the wall. Okay, so that's the feature benefit thing. Now, anybody who's listening to this right now who, who is familiar with features and benefits, I mean, this is probably bored the heck out of you because you know this and you understand these nuances in marketing that you have to look and see. Sometimes you have to look very carefully. Like, is this a feature that's being described? Is this a benefit? You know, how strong is that benefit being communicated to me? That sort of thing. And, you know, how compelling is it? How, how much does it make me want to buy this product and want to be uh, a consumer of this product? Okay. So if you guys haven't used these, these, you know, approaches before in terms of, you know, is it a feature or benefit? Which one do I use? How many do I use? You know, whatever. Then this is going to be a little bit educational to you even before I get to the main part of the podcast. But, but this is essentially a crux of marketing and advertising is how you take these sorts of, of, um, of points, you know, generically speaking, about your product or service, whether they be features, whether they be benefits, and how you wield them to compel someone to, you know, an action, you know, an action step, you know, buying the product, having a demo of the product, testing the product out, you know, taking a sample of the service that you're providing, whatever the case might be. Okay. So that's, that's really the realm of traditional features and benefits. Now, let me talk about this ad that I saw on New Year's Eve. We'll call it New Year's Eve. And I forget what's, what channel we were watching. I think we just had the TV on in the background. It was just, it was one of those things where I wasn't even really paying attention, but something caught my eye and I, and I, and I stopped to look at it. And it was, it was a commercial that you can find it on YouTube. I'll, I'll let you guys know exactly what, um, what the name of the commercial is or how you can search on it and find it if we don't already have it posted on one of our uh, platforms. But basically, without telling you what it was at first, let me just say, I look over at the TV, I see this very sort of lush imagery on the screen, like something that was very, like, it was clearly very high production quality. And so I just happened to continue to look at it, and I was like, oh, this, this, this looks like a very well-done commercial. So I start watching, expecting to turn away after a few seconds. And, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes later, I can't look away. I, I, I literally couldn't take my eyes off of this commercial. I was hanging on every frame waiting for the reveal. Like, what is this commercial about? I mean, and that's the point is, at first, I had no idea what this commercial was about. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating that. I I looked at it and I was like, you know, there was a frame with somebody, you know, uh, photographing wild horses in the forest. There was a frame where somebody was about to jump into a massive wave on their surfboard. There was a frame where somebody was driving a car around a racetrack. There was a frame, you know, about 
you know, whatever. I mean, fill in the blank. Like, like it was in this series of sort of like incredible. Oh, it was, there was a tennis player like, like practicing their shots across the tennis court to the automated ball machine in the middle of the night. And I'm like, what do these images have to do with each other? What does the tennis player have to do with the race car driver? Have to do with the the horse photographer? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, what are they all? What's the connection? Right? I mean, it was flabbergasting at first. But yet, even as I watched each of these frames and watched this commercial unfold, and it was making no sense to me, I couldn't stop looking. It not only looked beautiful, it was not only a beautiful shot commercial, but there was something in the messaging, something in the way that each of these frames, however disparate they were, was being presented, this kind of sense like, wait, they're building up to something. They're, they're about to tell me something important. They're about to tell me something very compelling that, you know, maybe even kind of sinks into my psyche a little bit because these images I'm seeing are very moving. Now, now again, I, I, I'm being a little bit kind of funny here about this, but, but let me assure you, this commercial was such high quality that in each frame, even though you didn't necessarily know what it had to do with the other frames, you were grabbed by the imagery. Like watching this woman practice her tennis shots at 2 a.m., and the, the exertion and the, and the sacrifice and the fatigue she was showing and the frustration that she wasn't getting every shot right, but she kept going and going. There was something compelling about that. There was something arresting about that, that perseverance. Um, when, when the photographer went into the forest and saw the wild horses and he was intent on getting that perfect shot, there was something arresting about that and compelling about that. You know, looking at his passion and his drive for getting the perfect image and how committed he was to doing that. Okay, uh, you know, the, the surfer about to, you know, plunge into this massive wave, the danger that it represented, the fact that they looked like they were about to nearly sacrifice themselves for this once in a lifetime moment, for this, for this uh, momentary plunge into the surf. It, it just, it was something, something about it, you just couldn't look away. You just couldn't, you wanted to see what happened to the person. You wanted to see if they made, if they were able to surf the wave. So, so, so as I go through all that, and I'm like, what is this? All of a sudden, at the end of the commercial, this black and white image comes up. And again, in its own right, a very compelling still image, black and white, grainy, old school. I mean, I don't know what year it was from, but it was, I mean, the dress was clearly from, let's say, early 20th century was my guess. Um, and it showed a child sitting atop what appeared to be a small boxcar. And, you know, like one of those cars that like kids make and race and stuff like that. And there were some adults nearby kind of looking at him. But he had this, I can't even describe it. You guys have to go look at this thing and, and see what I'm talking about. See if you feel the same thing. But there was something about his posture sitting on top of this car and just being kind of just, just perched atop it with a very confident, very authoritative, um, you know, you know, sort of uh, uh, comportment to him. And it said next to the image, Ferry Porsche. And I was like, wait a second. Did I just watch a car commercial? <laughs> Did I just watch a commercial about Porsche vehicles? And sure enough, when that still image was taken away, it was replaced by the race car scene that showed, which I, if I had been a little more perceptive, I probably would have picked up on it. Um, as I remember the commercial, it wasn't perfectly visible, but you probably, like someone who understands or was really paying close attention right from the onset or understands what these car silhouettes look like, uh, they would have seen that this was probably a, a, a Porsche commercial. Like, they probably would have detected a little bit sooner. For me, I was just absorbed by the other imagery, and I didn't make any distinction. But at the end of the commercial, it's more clearly revealed that they're they're depicting... Uh, a Porsche uh, sports car going around the racetrack and, you know, just invigorating the driver. And so the tagline of the commercial is dreamers, period, on, period, one of us. So dreamers on, one of us. And so this whole, you know, this, this entire commercial kind of culminates in this, um, you know, in this, in this, in this imagery of this vehicle and, and, you know, of it going around the racetrack and, you know, you know, kind of bringing life to the driver in some respects. And it just, 
it was like, wow, that's what that was all about. You know, that's what all of those sort of lifestyle depicting images and imagery was culminating in, was to sell this car. And so what was fascinating about it to me when we now, so that, that was kind of the, the ad that I want to tell you guys about. That's, that's the piece of this podcast that, you know, I want to kind of wrap up by encouraging you to watch this commercial. I think it's in its full form. It's about two minutes and 20 seconds, if I remember correctly, maybe give or take a few seconds. So I would absolutely encourage you to watch it. I think it's, it's, it's a case study in how you use, you know, branding, number one, the, the branding of Porsche, you know, overarching the entire commercial, but how you use particular imagery, wording, messaging, um, intonation, you know, the background, uh, you know, sort of, of uh, atmospherics to really be very advanced in the way you sell a product in this case or, or a service as the case may be. So I definitely encourage you guys to watch that. And I think the key takeaways that I want to segue into the last part of the podcast with is that this was a car commercial where 95% of the commercial, there was no car. Okay. I mean, you know, there was everything else. There was, there was surfing, there were wild horses, there was a, a tennis player. There was all kinds of other stuff, but there was very little, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there were these little slices showing the, the vehicle and the car moving really fast and so forth. But there was all this other stuff that had nothing to do with it. And so that kind of jumped out, just in terms of the, the, the totality of it. Then you look at, you know, the fact that there were no features in this commercial. I learned nothing about Porsche from this commercial. I don't know anything. I don't even know if they said what kind of car it was that they were showing, what, what, what model Porsche it was. If I recall correctly, they don't say anything about the model. I mean, a Porsche lover would probably be able to, to, to tell. But, I mean, they're not, they're not talking about, you know, how, how fast it goes, the size of its engine, how many people it seats, how much it weighs, what the torque is, what, what the trunk capacity is, if they even have a trunk. I don't think they do. Um, but, but there was nothing feature-wise, absolutely nothing. It was all benefit. And not only that, it was what I would call, this is my own terminology that I'm coining here, existential benefit. So this is the segue to the last part of the, the podcast. And you say, Chris, what does this all mean? Why are you talking to me about this? Why should I even be thinking about this when I'm trying to market or, or uh, sell my own product or service? What Porsche was able to achieve in this commercial, I believe, goes beyond benefits, right? So the benefit would be, let's walk through it. The Porsche has, I don't know, uh, a V12 engine that can go up to 190 miles an hour in six seconds flat. There's your feature. The benefit is, oh, I could drive from uh, Washington, D.C. to New York in two and a half hours if I wasn't stopped by a policeman or had to make any stops because the car goes so fast. So it's like, okay, um, great. That's great feature, great benefit, you know, what else is there? What else can be said about it? What I believe is this commercial takes it into a different realm where you're not in a feature benefit conversation anymore. You're in what I would, what I would uh, call an existential benefit kind of space. And, and you say, what's the difference? What are you talking about, Chris? What do you mean benefit versus existential benefit? The commercial depicted, I mean, it wasn't depicting benefits. It was depicting entire lifestyles. It was depicting entire personalities. It was depicting people's attitude towards life. <laughs> okay, like like the, the photographer of the wild horses lives a lifestyle of commitment and passion and desire to get the perfect shot, to make, you know, to, to bring to life these beautiful animals that he happens to be obsessed with and he puts every ounce of effort and every ounce of concentration and every ounce of, um, you know, of diligence into capturing and bringing to life for people who consume those photographs. Okay, so so they're not they're not even talking about the benefit that the car brings to this individual. They're showing they're putting next to the car as a product an entire lifestyle, an entire mindset, an entire attitude that they are intimating to you, the viewer, people who think and act and do 
like this guy taking the photographs of the horses, he's the kind of guy who drives a Porsche. You know, the, the, the surfer, that's the kind of person that drives a Porsche. That's the kind of person that desires and deserves that kind of vehicle, that kind of performance vehicle. And, it's, and, the, and the question is then being begged by the commercial, are you that sort of person, right? Or, or in a reverse sense, if you acquire this vehicle, won't you too live a lifestyle like this? Won't you too, you know, approach life in this manner, you know, or approach your work, your passion in the same manner? And there's an equation going on there, right? The passion that Porsche puts into creating the finest sports cars, right, that they're, they're touting, is the same passion that they're intimating you, the viewer, put into your work and into your life's work, your life's passion. And they're putting those two things on the same plane. And they're sitting them next to each other and saying one begets the other. And almost to the point we don't know which one comes first, right? Does, does the, person who have tremendous, the person who has tremendous passion about their work go get a vehicle like this? Or does the person who, go gets a ve- who goes and gets a vehicle like this bring that passion and that attitude into their work? And it becomes seamless. It becomes sort of a, a loop that goes around. And you just you can't, tell, you can't tell them apart. You just start to equate the two together. And so I think when you, when you get into these kinds of, of pieces of advertising where you can't tell, first of all, there's no defined benefit that's even being, I mean, forget about features. There's absolutely no features in the commercial, but there's not even defined benefits. There's these sort of amorphous and esoteric, you know, intimations <laughs> that there's going to be some macro benefit that accrues to you and your lifestyle because of this this vehicle because of this product when you get into that realm and you can pull that off you are now selling purely 1000 percent on brand you are not selling on anything else i mean you're not mentioning a price you're not comparing yourself to any other car i mean porsche there's no price on the screen you have no idea how much that vehicle or any other vehicle they have costs you don't care it doesn't matter they're not, they're not even beginning to attempt to say, hey, we have a better sports car than blank. We have a better sports car than this other manufacturer, this other car company. They don't even get into that. They don't need to. They just need to put that Porsche symbol up on the screen at the end of this commercial that I'm describing, and they've presented their brand to you in a way that is utterly untouchable by any other brand. I mean, it cannot be penetrated in in any specific way. Now, obviously, other companies can run their commercials, they can run their branding, and they can compete on their own, you know, the the stature of their own brand. So I'm not saying they can't do that. But they can't come up against Porsche one-to-one, just like Porsche isn't attempting to go up against them one-to-one. They're crafting this, this piece of advertising that is designed to get you to fuse the two concepts together. The exhilaration of the vehicle... And, it's, and, it's, and how fine that vehicle is made, how precise, how quality it is, with, you know, equating that with this uber-passionate, uber-meaningful existence that the people in the commercial are, are, are shown living and are shown participating in, okay? And so the only way you can pull that off, I mean, the only way you can pull that off is through branding. And so that kind of wraps up the podcast with the sort of concluding thoughts I want you guys to think about. And I'm, I'm leaving this somewhat open-ended because this is something we're going to be coming back to a lot. I mean, if you go back a few episodes, um, you know, you go back to the three stages of marketing, I believe that was episode 19, uh, if I remember correctly. And I talked about the third stage, that the top stage is where you get into becoming a media company and you're actually putting your branding and your content making ahead of your product or service, you know, like content and branding is 1A, product or service is 1B. This is what I'm talking about. You know, when, when you get into that realm of doing marketing as a function of being a media company, you're trading on brand only. You're not even, you're not even in the game, you know, cutting prices, discounting, th- you're out of that game. And all you're doing, all you are doing is building and strengthening your brand so that 
when you run a commercial like this Porsche commercial I'm talking about, it hits hard. It's the kind of thing that somebody cannot look away from. And when your symbol comes up at the end or your slogan comes up or your, your motto comes up on the screen, whatever, whatever thing you use to brand yourself, there is no mistaking that, that there's a fusion between that advertising and that brand, that brand name, that brand logo, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're saying, you know, it, it, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, Chris, that, that sounds great, you know, very, very lofty, very noble, but I'm nowhere near that. You know, I haven't even generated additional revenue or clients out of my marketing. I'm still stuck on, you know, <laughs> on go. Then I get it. You know, this is not for you yet. This is not for you to be obsessed with or concerned about in, in a tactical sense right now. You know, you need to be finding ways to, to gain traction, you know, at the very lower tactical level to start differentiating your brand and your product and your service and start building a reputation for being in a league of your own. So that's a long, hard climb that you're, that you're undergoing. But I think that um, when you've progressed far enough beyond that, and hopefully you've been paying strategic attention to how you brand yourself and how you present yourself, it eventually gives you the opportunity to culminate that effort and, and, and put out the sort of material that achieves the same kind of function and result as this Porsche commercial. And so it's definitely down the road for many small businesses and even medium-sized business, businesses to do this. But I know that there are some of you listening out there that are going to be like, no, this is the stage that we're at. We need to start executing on this. We need to start bringing home these concepts and these branding uh, approaches so that we can get into a league of our own. So we're not battling on price. We're not battling down in the trenches anymore. We've distinguished ourselves. We've branded ourselves. People recognize us. They only want to do business with us. They only want to buy from us. That's the promised land. That's where everybody technically or theoretically is trying to get to, right? And so I think, you know, the lesson in this commercial isn't necessarily that you got to go make a commercial like that. I mean, first of all, I would love to know how much that commercial costs to make. I mean, I, I would have to imagine it's a six-figure minimum investment that was made in that. And I, I don't know, that may just be my own naivety of never producing a television commercial, but I'd really be interested to know how much that commercial cost to make because of some of the locations it was shot at, you know, some of the, the, some of the actions being depicted were even maybe you know, considered a little bit dangerous, right? So you have to have the right people doing them and stuff like that. I mean, it was, it was so high gloss. I absolutely think it, it probably broke the bank a little bit. But so the, the, the lesson here, guys, isn't, hey, go out and make a commercial like the Porsche commercial. I mean, that's, that's, that's going to be beyond your reach more than likely at this stage of your development if you're a small business and you're getting started or you're just kind of working your way through the growing pains of building your business. But at a minimum, what I want to do is kind of stick this in the back of your head and get you thinking about, okay, where's this all going? Like, where am I, what's the trajectory here? And where am I pointing the business towards so that eventually I'm, I'm taking the right steps to be able to get into that realm of pure branding and pure uh, messaging like the commercial I described today? So, I, I would think the takeaway here is watch the commercial, you know, study these types of, and not just this one commercial, I mean, obviously there's other stuff like this out there. Study this kind of material. Study how these things are done and communicated. Look closely at how brands like Porsche, you know, Coca-Cola, like all the big boys and girls, how, how they are presenting their brand and their product. And study that with a keen eye. And think about what can you do at, at, at the level that you're at with the ability to invest whatever resources you have. What, what can you do? What do you need to do to at least start plotting a course to get into that realm of selling on brand? And so I think it's just something that you have to, um, you, you know, if, if, you, if, you keep, if you keep your eye off that ball and you never think about it, you're, you're just not going to be ready for it when the time comes. So you really have to, you know, point yourself in that direction, think about it, study it, and say, okay, how can I start, what, what are the existential benefits that I can communicate about my brand, my product, my service, and start going that direction? So on a totally different podcast, we'll unpack that a little bit. We'll, we'll peel back that onion and say, okay, let's talk about what, how could you take 
you know, your product or service. Maybe we go through a few examples and say, how can we progress that from feature to benefit to existential benefit and really start carving out, you know, a space there from a branding perspective. Okay. So let's wrap it up here, guys. I really appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. First episode of 2022. Super exciting. Uh, We'll be back later this week with episode 25. In the meantime, uh, again, like, share, subscribe. Check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, website, transform.com. I would be super excited to hear from you guys. Uh, Thanks again. I'm Chris Anastasio signing off, and uh, we'll talk to you guys again later this week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.